Okay, so I think uh, some of you uh, asked me about the uh, solution for lab number three. So as I mentioned in the announcement there, I'm going to release uh, a partial solution. So I call this partial because it's actually a solution to a different design problem. But the design problem also involves about undo redo, and also in, it actually also involves the, uh, uh, the board. So you can also take it uh, as a reference solution for your lab three. It's not exactly to deal with the projectile or the star fighter, not exactly, because your project is actually quite substanti uh, substantially different from your lab three. Okay, that's a partial solution I will make available tomorrow. And then uh, it, the, main, uh, the main lesson would be for you to learn about the undo redo design pattern, okay? All right, uh, let me start with uh, the question there. We don't have so many questions there. I only saw one from the Google Doc. So I would suggest I start with that one. And then if you got any follow-up question or some new question about week number eight lecture, and then we'll start with that too. Okay, so the only question I got is from Amir, okay, about uh, the first part of the week number eight, about the generics, okay? Let me read through his question there, and then I will give my response about this question here. Okay, okay let me just make sure, okay. Okay, so uh, in uh, lecture eight, eight, part two, is about, uh, about the generics, especially when we talk about how the general book can actually violate the single choice principle because you need to have exhaustive, uh, exhaustive checks on the uh, dynamic type, right? The general book. For that part, I assume you actually already uh, studied. Okay, so uh, for an array with a mixing uh, mixture of polymorphic type, basically got different dynamic type in the array of any, like array of objects. You got string, you got date, you got any, uh, any type. So for storage, the array of any is very accommodating. You can store anything into it. And then it's going to violate the single choice principle because every time you retrieve anything from the general book of type any, you, uh, you really need to cast every element properly. And the problem is because casting is really a manual process. So if you believe uh, the item you're retrieving is really of string type, but it maybe happens to be a date type, in that case, you will get a uh, like a runtime violation or like a class cast exception in Java. That's kind of, that's kind of the, uh, the discussion we, we set in the lecture, okay? So now, Amir's question was, because later on we propose uh, about a solution using generic parameter for your class, he was wondering how this can solve the single choice principle problem, really. So why do we not violate the single choice principle? So I'll try to use a different example, maybe try, try to explain to you why. When you use the generic uh, parameter properly, you wouldn't really violate uh, the single choice principle because you don't need them. Uh, you don't really need to do any. Uh, you don't need to do any type casting. That's kind of the idea. Okay, so that's a question. So why can the generic parameter solve the uh, violation of the single choice principle that we saw in the general book? Okay, let's see. I kind of put uh, the book and also uh, you can think about these two classes. You have seen them already, right? You can think about this book over here is the general book that we spoke about, right? You can see we got an, an array of any, right? That's a general book. And then you can see when you want to add a record, you can add anything into it. Any class that's a descending class of any can be added. And also for the get, when you do retrieval, you can retrieve anything, meaning that you cannot have any, uh, ex you, you cannot have too many expectations on anything that you, re you retrieve from the uh, general book. In that case, uh, all you can do, uh, what you re you're required to do is to do uh, typecasting. And also whenever you want to retrieve something back, you want to say if dynamically, uh, like an instance of, you want to say attached, if uh, attached, whatever type it is, that you, whatever you retrieve over there. And uh, you, also you want to do else if uh, attached again, you want to do so many uh, if then else checks for every occasion. So that violates the single choice principle, okay? So now we want to just do one more example to see how this can be the case, right? On the other hand, if you use a generic book, you got generic parameter G over here, by choosing a proper insta uh, insta uh, instantiation type for the G, when you declare the uh, book, you can avoid uh, all the unnecessary uh, typecast. Okay, let's see how this can, uh, can be done. Let me use a new example for you, okay? Remember, this is the uh, smartphone hierarchy that we had from the inheritance review lecture, right? So I assume you have some familiarity with it, okay? Let's try this. Let's now pursue, uh, let's now assume the following variable declaration. Let's say we got P1 of type iPhone X, uh, uh, 10S Max. Okay, let me just uh, highlight 
So this is one static type we have, which is over here. Okay. I hope the font size is actually okay for you. But if you think that's really, uh, really too small, okay, basically that's here. iPhone 10 is max, right? And also another one we got iPhone 11 Pro, okay, over here. Okay, and then we simply create P1 and P2. And since we don't have the curly brackets over here, so that means dynamically for P1 and P2, their dynamic type simply correspond to their static type, simply, right? Okay, so let me be a little bit more uh, careful with the color. So why don't I put the pink? So that means dynamically we have P1 and P2. One is of this particular type, the other one is of this type, right? So these are the two uh, objects, P1 and P2. And let's say we declare uh, B1 and B2. So over here, I'm, uh, I'm being a little bit less cautious because you definitely cannot have uh, two classes of the same, uh, same name, even though one is generic, the other one is not. I'm just trying to put everything together. So if you really want to try this example here, you have to rename one to be maybe book one, the other one to be book two. Okay, but for now, you can see the difference uh, just conceptually. So this B1 over here is a general book. Okay, so B1 over here is a general book. Meaning that you can put anything into B1, including P1 and P2. I, uh, I simply just put some uh, iOS phone into it, okay? On the other hand, for uh, B2 over here, it's a generic book. And now notice the crucial difference. Because over here, I'm being very cautious about choosing what type I want to instantiate the G over here into, right? I simply choose iOS. So as soon as I do that, so that means under, so now, so that means over here in the context of this particular generic class, I simply instantiate this one to be iOS. Accordingly, every occurrence of the G will be replaced by iOS. iOS and also iOS. So it will be as if I declare this particular polymorphic array simply of iOS type, right? So that's what I have done so far. On the other hand, if you look at a general book, you can see we still got any and also any and also any over here, right? It stays the same, right? So you can see uh, one, one great advantage about using generic uh, class would be you, uh, by choosing the type, you're trying to instantiate a generic parameter, the corresponding definition over here will simply just change accordingly, right? That's the great advantage that we spoke about uh, many times. Okay, and then we say create B1, create B2. We simply create an empty book, okay? So now let's think about the following. So whenever I use the blue, that means I'm talking about the general book. Let's talk about the general book first over here, okay? So now the general book is actually B1. So now if I say B1 dot uh, add, okay? And then uh, let me just say whatever string, the string value here is not really important, whatever string. And I'm going to add maybe P1. This one should compile because iPhone 10s Max is a descendant class of any, so that's fine, right? I can also say b2 dot add. And also p2, let me just add these two just for now, okay? Uh, the reason that I can do p1 and p2 over here is simply because they're both subclasses of just any, okay? That's the reason. Let me try also for the generic book on the other, on the other hand, okay, on the other side. So now over here, if I say, uh, oh, sorry, I made some typo over here. That should be just B1, okay? Just B1, okay, just B1 here. Okay, let's talk about B2 over here. So if I say B2 dot add, and then I will simply put, uh, of course I can put P1, I can put P2. And then again, so the first value will be a string. Let's not worry about it. I can say P1 and also B2 dot add and also some string value over here, and then I say P2. So these two lines also compile, but for the different reason. The, re uh, the, e the reason is you can say B2 and B2. Somehow the uh, type over here has been instantiated by iOS. So now P1, is it a uh, descendant class of iOS? That's what we want to ask, right? So P1 is actually iPhone XS Max. Is iPhone XS Max a descendant class of iOS? Indeed, it is. So that one will compile. Remember, we talked about the polymorphic uh, arguments, right? Before in the inheritance review lecture, okay? And then what about this line here? Well, it will compile for a similar reason. 
So now I can see P2 statically is iPhone 11 Pro, and then the ad over here is, uh, is expecting iOS for this particular instantiation. So that one will also compile, right? Recap, these two lines compile, these two lines also compile, but for different reasons. So later on, let's say in the exam, uh, of course, you're still far away. Later on, if you're in the exam, if I ever ask you some short, uh, short answer questions, I will ask you to say, these two are simply just valid, but why? What, uh, how, how are the reasons different, right? So that will be something you want to be able to say, okay? All right, so far so good. So now let me try one thing here to illustrate to you the difference. Now you can see why. For the generic design, the single choice principle will be able to, to preserve. Let me say one more thing here. It will be very important. So when you're trying to use a generic class, the instantiation you choose over here, so this will be the chosen instantiation type. by the clients. So for me as a client for this particular book, before I, before I instantiate this particular type over here, uh, G by iOS, I got many candidates over here. I could have instantiated into smartphone. I could have instantiated into iOS, for example, right? So now, what would be the difference? Well, I can tell you that both are valid, but now what would be the difference between if I chose iOS versus smartphone? That would be the question, right? So. Anybody want to respond to me? So now, let me ask you guys this question here. Here's a question, which is very important. Let me write it down. Question over here. What will be the difference between book of iOS versus the book of uh, smartphone, okay? Smartphone. So apparently these are two different design choices, but what would be the uh, difference? Anybody? In terms of, okay, I can let you be more, a little bit more focused on your question here. In terms of the uh, at versus get. So that's where you can center around your uh, answer, okay? Book of iOS has wider expectations. I like that answer, Nora. That's good. That's true. And also for Amir, the book of iOS can keep a uh, smartphone as well. No, actually, that one is not true, Amir. So now let's say this. If you actually chose, let's say for this particular one, right? Let's say you chose this one here. If you chose that to be iOS, let me just ask something just to uh, clarify your concern. If I got P0 over here, and then if you got smartphone over here, right? So now, if I say b2 dot at over here and p0, and we know from the inheritance lecture this one should not compile, right? Because in this particular instantiation for iOS, so that means for the at is going to be iOS. So now, is the static type of p0, which is smartphone, is smartphone a descendant class of iOS? Apparently, it is not. So you cannot hold any smartphone statically in the uh, B2, right? If you chose this particular instantiation, right? That's something uh, we want to uh, clarify, okay? Just for Amir, okay? Uh, let me just go on, okay? I think what Nora said was exactly correct, okay? So now think about this. Let's say we got these two instantiation. Let's say this is the green one, okay? Let me say this is the orange, okay? These two, okay? Uh, let me just highlight it just to make it more obvious. So this is design number one, and this is design number two, okay? These two, okay? So now, basically, you have more, you have wider expectation, especially for the get, okay? Okay, uh, why is that? Think about what's gonna happen here. When you get this particular choice, so that means you're going to replace this by, oh, iOS will be just the same, right? So iOS over here, iOS over here, and also iOS for the add, and also iOS for the return type. So what about this particular design, this guy over here, right? The second one. This one over here, every occurrence of uh, G, first of all, G will be uh, instantiated by smartphone. So that means the array will be just of smartphone. And this will be smartphone. And this will be smartphone over here. So now if you think about over here, uh, for the green one, for the get, apparently 
having the iOS as a, uh, as the uh, return type has wider expectation than simply just smartphone. Agree? Because smartphone is actually as uh, is actually an ancestor ancestor class over here. So that's what well, that's why it got narrower expectation, right? So for the get, uh, iOS has wider expectation. On the other hand, everything is kind of symmetric. However, what's really the good thing about the uh, first one? The first one is basically easier for you to do the addition because now if you look at the ad over here, you can see we have smartphone versus iOS. We're basically asking the number of descending classes for iOS, which is basically particular this particular subtree versus the uh, number of descending classes for a smartphone, which is strictly larger. Right, so that means you're getting like a, a more flexibility in terms of uh, adding uh, adding uh, smartphones into the uh, uh, book, right? So now, for this one over here, you, uh, it's more flexible, more generous, flexible for uh, addition. Well, thinking this way. Compare compare uh, this design over here versus this one. You can think about this one here. It's moving closer to the any because you are basically moving from iOS into upper level smartphone. The extreme case would be you simply move all the way to any, right? That's how you can understand it, right? It's a little bit like a sidetrack, but I, I do want to explain to you. you whenever you choose the uh, as a client, when you choose the type to instantiate, you got to be very careful. It has to be a conscious choice. So you always got to think about. If I choose iOS, so that simply means later on when I retrieve anything from uh, the book, I can only have I can have expectation on the iOS, including uh, surf web, FaceTime, and also dial. On the other hand, if I got smartphone as the choice to for instantiation, in that case I can only get uh, from the get from the uh, get over here. So that'll be a uh, smartphone, and then I can only expect dial and surf web. Right? That's the difference. All right. So now let me just talk about stuff over here. Let me just continue to make a conclusion. Okay. So now let's say after these two, let me write one more line. If I say b2 dot get, okay, b2 dot get, and then I'm going to just give some string over here, whatever string it is. Okay. And now if I say, for example, dot FaceTime. So I hope everybody will agree. This will just compile, right? So this should be okay. When I say that FaceTime, right? So this one will definitely just compile. I'll put a check. Very quickly, why? Because for this particular instantiation, G has been instantiated by iOS. So that means the get is going to return iOS. So now the return type is simply iOS. That's why you can simply do FaceTime. No cast will be necessary. Given that I chose my iOS properly, I know that everything I want to return back over here will be just iOS. That's why I can simply call the face calling without having to cast. On the other hand, right now, if I do B1 over here, right? So if I say B1 dot, let's say get, and then maybe something over here. Now I cannot say FaceTime anymore. I can tell you that I cannot even say dial. Both of them will simply just not compile. Is simply because you can see uh, over here, uh, get over here is simply just returning any. So now any does not really define dial and FaceTime. They only belong to either the smartphone or they belong to the iOS over here, right? So now these two will not work unless I do a typecast. And then Amir, this is the scenario where you can see if you got simply a book of any. So very, uh, even though you're pretty sure the smartphone has been added into the book, but you still have to do typecast, and then, uh, and then you have to dis uh, discriminate on the dynamic type and to see what you want to do with them. Because in case it is iPhone XS Max, you, can, uh, you might do something with it, but in case it's iPhone 11 Pro, you can even do quick take. So after the typecast, you will be able to do it, right? All right, that's a long discussion about uh, the comparison between general book versus generic book. I hope that makes sense. Amir, does it make sense to you about the explanation? Or you still, okay, good, okay, very good. Again, the very question about from Amir is about single choice principle. But I just extended that discussion a little bit just to show you everything. 
All right, so that's about the, the only question we got so far from the uh, Google Doc. So do you guys got any more questions for this week? So from Robbie, in ETF, what would be the purpose uh, be the read feature in the state design pattern? Uh, what would be the purpose be uh, of the read feature in the state design pattern? So, um, Robbie, I'm trying to understand your question over here. So let's say this, right? Give me one moment. Let me uh, get a slice. Okay, this is your slice for the state design pattern. So when you say read over here. Okay, so you can see over here. So this is your, uh, the, the architecture for the state design pattern. And Robbie is referring to the read uh, routine over here. So we say that we call, okay, we call these guys the components of the template or components of the pattern. On the other hand, we say the execute is really the, the template itself or the, or the uh, structure of the pattern. So now Robbie was asking about uh, how this read should be used in the ETF. So I don't think that there's anything to do with the ETF really. So I would say in your project, for example, if you find any part of your project that's really uh, practicable to having a state pattern, in which case you can definitely use it. However, for your states, you may not need to have read, display, correct process and message anymore. You have to somehow design to decide uh, which uh, routine should be deferred in the, in the state for the, dis, uh, for the Space Defender 2 uh, program. It doesn't have to be the read, display, correct and process and message. It doesn't have to be. But you, I'm expecting to see some defer routines for the state class. Uh, for your uh, pattern implementation, if you want to have one, okay? So Rabi, is that kind of answering your question or I'm not really answering your questions? Good, okay. So Haber was asking, can we ask about a project? I would say the project better be left to the office hour. Uh, so I also, I want to prioritize to fellow, uh, your fellow student who actually want to ask about week number eight. So I would say if you got any questions specific to the project, I'll leave that to the office hour. That'll be better. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. But if we got, uh, if we got a spare time today, yes, you can ask as well. Yeah. Jiahao is asking, can you, uh, for the descending clauses over here, for example, can these clauses be singleton? So for example, you might say, maybe you have a single data access class simply to the states. I would say that one is up to your design. The standard state design pattern there, we don't really have any notion about singleton. But for your project or for whatever your development you're, you're doing, if you believe there should be only a single data access, in that case, you can definitely do, uh, you can definitely uh, add a single data access to it if you, if you wish. You have a question about week seven quiz, sure, which one? Which question? We can talk about that quiz. I think that'll be relevant. Uh, sir. Um, yes. The, uh, the question, um, so it's got, the object is, um, the static type is A, and then you're trying to cast that into T, and you ask uh, what can be the valid dynamic type of T. Sure, Hubbard, just, uh, oh, sorry, not Hubbard, another, oh, ha, okay. Uh, Uh, let me give me one moment. Okay, yes. I will, I will re uh, retrieve the question and then I will respond to you. Yes, give me one moment. Uh, quiz number seven. And then uh, let me go to, you're saying the question about what are the possible dynamic types, is that correct? Um, yeah. Okay, give me one moment. I'll find it out. I'll find a similar question here because somehow the question of randomized. I'm not too sure if that's exactly the one you were seeing. Uh, give me one moment. Let's see this. You talk about dynamic types. Okay, I see. Okay. Okay. Possibly this is the one. Is this the one? Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, let me discuss this. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, so now, yeah, give me uh, a few seconds. I will set it up on my iPad and then we'll discuss that. 
Okay, first of all, we got that uh, fragment. Okay, let me also copy the question itself. Okay, almost done. Okay, let's now talk about it. Uh, let me move this away. Okay, good. Okay, over here. Okay, good. Okay, I think, uh, of course, the critical step would be you want to say, uh, we haven't done this uh, so far in the Q&A, so let's do it together. So basically, given this particular class decorations, right, so you want to build the inheritance hierarchy tree. Let's do it together, okay? So I would say what how I would approach it would be, let me just worry about just the uh, uh, class and inheritance. Let me only worry about this. Let me get a tree first, and then I'll worry about it that we define uh, a little bit later, okay? So let me start with this. B inherits from G. So B inherits from G, and also D inherits from A, and also you can see G inherits from A, right? So G inherits from A, and also D inherits from A. Okay, C inherits from F, and also E inherits from G. Okay, so let me just put this one here. Okay, and also A inherits from F, and also C inherits from F, right? You don't necessarily have to go, you know, with this order, right? Just basically, when you're doing it by yourself, uh, whichever way there's more efficient, okay? Okay, so that's the inheritance hierarchy we have. Uh, uh, so am I doing uh, A inherits from F? And then, oh, sorry, uh, C inherits from F, sorry. This should be C, beg your pardon. Okay, that's a hierarchy we have, right? I can tell you that over here, based on this, let's say for this question specifically, given on this, I can already answer the question because it's only about what dynamic type you can actually pass, right? Let's see this. Uh, what we have is uh, object A, A is over here, right? And then you're simply asking, what can the T be for the diamond type? So now uh, let's now uh, let's now recall intu intuitively what what does it really mean? Basically, any T that can fulfill the expectation. on A should be valid, right? So dynamically, you want to make sure the object you choose to instantiate the objects can fulfill whatever we expect on, on A, right? So let's uh, understand that first. So now consequently, so what can be the, uh, what can be the classes that can fulfill the expectation for A? Well, we, as we learned uh, from, uh, basically as we learned from uh, the lecture, all the descendant classes can do including A itself and uh, basically like this. All the descendants of A. Basically, we're excluding C, we're also excluding F, All right? So that means the answer should be A, G, B, E, D. So these should be the answer. Okay, so A, B, G, E, and D basically all the descendants. So does it answer your questions? Um, so why, why can't we uh, do the upward casting into F? Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, you're, uh, you're right. So, but yeah, that's another topic basically. But here you can see the thing, syntax over here is already fixed. We're saying that given this particular uh, creation uh, syntax, what can you pass over here as the uh, enemy type, right? In that case, uh, I think you can only pass whatever the descending classes is, is uh, over here. Okay, so that's okay. Why. I got it, okay. Okay, good, yeah. But if you talk about typecast, that's, an, that's another story for sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right. All right, guys, any other questions about uh, do you, have any, do you have any other questions on the quiz number seven? Feel free, since I already got a diagram set up, so we, 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 don't, we don't want to waste it, right? Uh, okay, so Robbie was asking something to follow up. So uh, on the quiz, FG, 
uh, be called on dynamic type G. So Robbie, can you remind me over here? So uh, I need to look up the question actually. Um, whenever you talk about to call, I can, I can make some example for you. For example here, if I got objects over here, let's say of type, and you can see for, uh, let's say for G over here, right? So you can see the new feature we declare at this level here is FG, okay? So G is, uh, on the other hand, let's say this. If I say objects, it's a type A, okay? And then over here, if I say creates G, dynamic type, OBJ dot make, okay? So now based on our reasoning, so this should be a valid dynamic type for A because G is a descending class of A, so that's okay. However, if we say OBJ dot FG, so Robbie was asking, should this compile? Given that dynamically, you can see OBJ is really pointing to some objects of type G dyna dynamically, right? Now let me write a little bit better. The answer is this cannot uh, comp uh, this will not compile because Robbie, what matters when you talk about compilation is not a dynamic type. Dynamic type only uh, matters when you talk about dynamic binding. But now, objects over here was declared to be statically A. So now, is FG part of the expectation for A? Apparently it's not. So that's why you wouldn't compile, okay? Now compile because OBJ static type is A, which does not include the expectation of FG. So Robbie, that's why, all right? Okay, hopefully Robbie, that's okay for you. Okay, I got another question here from Emro. So he is referring to this architecture over here. Let me read out the question here. Uh, can we implement execute? Uh, you're talking about execute over here, okay? The pattern. Can we implement the execute in each of the state implementation classes? Okay, good, okay. Uh, I would say, okay. Okay, that might be worth uh, talking about it, okay. Let me uh, capture this diagram over here and talk about it. Apparently, we, uh, in the lecture, we just talked about a standard pattern. If there's any adaptation, adaptation you want to do for your project or for your developments, that's another story, right? Okay, let's say, so, Emro, uh, let me make sure I, I'm, I'm understanding you correctly. What you're suggesting is, Let's say you got execute over here, right? However, you want to say, rather than simply inheriting verbatim the execute into all the uh, effective state implementations, you want to say maybe execute over here, I want to, you know what, let me be a little bit lazy here. You want to say for every uh, state class, I'm going to say if uh, execute plus plus, meaning that we're going to redefine, right? Maybe that's what you meant. Yeah. Let me just uh, copy that, okay, for every one of them, and then we talk. You're saying that for this one here, it's going to be some execute over here just for this class. And then for this class here, we also got execute, right, another version. And for this class, we also got execute. Let me put it away. And then for this one here, we also got execute. We got execute over here. We got execute over here. And then we got execute over here. You're basically saying, the version that we have in the state class may not be so much applicable to every state. And then you will simply just have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You got seven different versions for the execute. That's basically what you're asking, right? So I would say if you do it this way, so what you're suggesting is execute over here from the states. is not really a template 
Or let me just make it more obvious. It's not really a common template. For all states uh, descending classes to use. If this is really what you meant to do, I think that you are better off just by changing this maybe from execute into just execute over here, just defer, just like every other feature, like a read, display, correct, and message and process. Because if every state's uh, class should have their own version of the execute, then the execute here is not really the execute that we talk about in the class, right? It's not a pattern anymore. It's simply just one of the components that might be for the potential template. So whenever we talk about a template pattern over there, the execute, the reason why it should be effective is because its definition can simply be, uh, be reused verbatim without being redefined in all the classes over here, right? That's why it should be effective. But now, if you decided that every uh, class should have their own version for the execute, in that case, this execute over here is not a template anymore. It just has common, just a, it should just be a, a deferred routine. So, Emerald, is, uh, do you think that answers your question? Yeah, you say maybe uh, the execute over here can maybe still be uh, implemented, and over here you simply say precursor. I would say it's not impossible. I would say that's less common. I think the reason that you want to have the execute being a template is the template should be somehow common to all the states. But maybe for your specific projects, you believe there's some common step that every state should really share. In that case, yes, you can also call precursor. That's fine too. Yeah. But I would say that's not really the template design pattern. Because when you say template, it should be the entire template is being reused uh, by the state uh, by the state classes. Oh, that was suggested by Nora, sorry. I thought it was uh, Emerald suggested that, but I think it's a valid point, Nora. So I would say you can definitely say, for example, let me, uh, you can say uh, the execute is still effective, but I will simply say a precursor and do something else. Yes, I think that's possible. It's just not a standard. You can do it, yes, for sure. But when we talk about a standard design pattern and also template pattern, it's really about the, the same template can be reused without any redefinition. Uh, in other classes. But if you believe for your particular application is necessary, then you should really do it. Yes. All right, any other questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, actually, uh, uh, Oh, Danny, so you were basically talking about the due dates for quiz number and number nine. Yeah, somebody brought that to my attention. I, I fixed them already, yes. So for, for quiz number eight, it should be, uh, should be due uh, this Friday. And for your quiz number nine, it should be open this Friday. I, I just set it up uh, wrongly. So I think it should be okay now if you check the e-class again. It's definitely a mistake. Very good, uh, thanks for telling me, that's good. Guys, any more questions about week number eight? I think uh, uh, so far after the reading week, uh, we spoke about uh, the state design pattern. And also, we will also talk about, uh, we talked about state, uh, state design pattern this uh, last week. And this week, starting from Wednesday, we'll learn about another two design patterns, which is an observer and also the event-driven design. And then uh, the next week's event, we'll talk about composite. And then the next week, we'll talk about visitor. So you can see we got we, uh, many design patterns are coming. So you don't want to get confused. You want to know for which uh, each design pattern, what should be the applicable problem scenario. You want to know that, right? Yeah, Parthiv asked a very good question here. Let me read it out. If we want to make a design for some software, let's say for your project, that's okay. Is it really necessary to follow a design pattern or we can make our own design pattern. I would say either you follow a design pattern faithfully without making any changes. For example, let's say for 
the state, let's use the state disadvantage, for example. If you believe for your projects, you simply want to adapt the state design pattern, either you can choose to really have some kind of execute, doesn't have to be execute, just some kind of execute that's going to be reused without any redefinition in every state class, that definitely uh, can work if that's applicable to your projects. On the other hand, does, uh, the design pattern doesn't really mean you cannot modify it, no. You can definitely apply to any uh, project specific uh, details to modify the pattern if you wish. For example, as Nora suggested, maybe for my particular projects, when the execute is actually inherited to maybe some patterns over here, I want to redefine that to be uh, slightly modified using precursor. That's also fine, right? So to your general question there, for any design pattern that we teach in this course, what well, you simply learn by yourself, for example, right? If you just do some extra reading, I would say, if you simply follow the design pattern faithfully and then solve the problem, good. However, it may not be this, uh, the case so uh, usually. So maybe you find that the design pattern only give you a very good starting points, but there might be some very uh, application specific details you have to add in to your implementation. That's also very possible, right? So either way is okay, as long as it works, all right? But of course, any new additions you add, to the, for example, if you, was, if you somehow want to modify the state design pattern, for example, right? You should, uh, whatever adapted, uh, adaptation you make, you want to somehow judge by the design principle we talked about. Does it still satisfy information hiding? Yes. And uh, does it really follow the uh, single choice principle? And we're gonna talk about more design principle as we go along towards the end of the course. So Patha, you may, uh, Patha you're making exactly the point, that's good. Yeah, overall, uh, after all, in this course, we can only teach you a limited number of design patterns just to get you uh, started. And also, we can only go over with you the most important design principles. That, uh, so I would say just uh, use them, you know, to uh, reflect on your design as you, go, as you go over your developments. Okay, any other questions? Amro, any tips for quiz number eight? Uh, I would say, uh, yeah, since you ask, I will try to respond. Tip number one, uh, when you actually, uh, you can see the, uh, the first part of your, uh, sorry, the first part of your quiz, uh, the first part of your lecture number eight does involve about, for example, as I just illustrated in this example here, Let's say if I got, for example, some, if I talk about at over here, so I really talk about polymorphic uh, arguments over here where let's say if that's iOS versus when it's a smartphone, the consequence will be different, right? Also, when I talk about a get over here, the return type can be iOS or it can be smartphone. Also, what will be the consequence? So I think for quiz number eight, it does involve the discussion about polymorphic uh, arguments and also polymorphic return values. So you may want to review uh, these two points from your, uh, for your lecture number seven. You may want to, okay? That's tip number one. And for tip number two, I think uh, when you review the state design pattern over here, I would say it's quite important. Okay, uh, okay, let me just go to index over here. So think about a, uh, the story we are telling in uh, uh, your lecture number eight. We basically started with uh, the motivating problem. So you want to understand, to formulate a motivating problem, what do you need? You need, you need a finite state machine, right? So you want to know about how to make a transition in the transition table. That's something uh, I'm pretty sure you know, but just make sure you know that very well. And also we talk about different design attempts, at least for the first and second one, and also the, uh, the first design attempt, uh, which is assembly style, and also the second design attempt, which is the hierarchical procedure style. You want to know clearly about what's the pros and cons for those two design attempts as we talk about, right? You want to be clear. So I may not just ask you programming related question or uh, maybe may, may a very technical question. I can just ask you conceptual questions there to say what's really the properties for each, uh, each design. So you want to be clear about it, right? And then for the state design pattern, you want to be very clear about two diagrams over here. So number one, you should really be clear about this architecture over here. You want to know what do we really mean when we say execute should be uh, effective, whereas all the other routines should be deferred, right? 
So that, that's why it, uh, it's called the template design pattern. You should know very well why it is the case. And you may also want to look at uh, dynamic binding, of course, you know, it's really important to understand uh, this fragment over here, right? And then this diagram here will be also very important. So I would suggest you want to understand very well uh, over here. Remember, there's a little small test. Uh, let me go to the code over here, uh, not here, uh, over here, right? So you want to know very well how we actually do the transition over here, right? Over here. And once you get a return value about a target state number, you're going to assign the current state to the corresponding elements in the polymorphic array. So you want to know how that happens. So I also illustrated to you on the lecture. So you want to review that as well. Okay. All right. Okay, Emerald, I hope that's enough tips for you. So I basically you gotta study everything, I'm afraid. Okay, I got one question from uh, Mohammed regarding week number seven. Sure, I'm uh, I'm a little bit confused on why upward casting is valid. Okay, isn't it just reducing the number of expectation? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, let me just uh, try this. You can think about uh, upward casting is really to reduce the expectation. That's right. But why would you do it? You can think about it's more about access control. I'll give you one example here. Okay, let's say uh, over here, this is my uh, mine. Okay, and let's say my phone is simply, let's say it's uh, iOS. Okay, I'll just make a sound example for you. Let's say statically this iOS, and then dynamically, doesn't matter, creates maybe iPhone XS 10s max mine the make okay so what we have done so far you can see uh, static type is iOS dynamic type is iPhone 10s max okay so far so good and then let's say we want to do upper casting and I'll explain to you why you may want to do it, okay? Let's say we want to do upper casting to smartphone, okay? But why would you want to do it? Let's say this. Uh, let's say over here, I can say check attached. I want to cast into maybe a smartphone, for example. Okay, and then let's say this. Let me say to borrow. Let's say I want to borrow my, my phone into, uh, to some, uh, I want to lend my phone to somebody else. To to uh, to land, okay. I think that's proper English. And then I would say to land, and then as oh, uh, actually, sorry, I do. Uh, my as okay keyword to land. Okay, and then over here, so now in this context over here, first of all, we know there's a valid cast. We simply upcast to smartphone, okay? So now think about, I'm going to lend this particular phone to somebody else, but somehow I want to block certain feature for them to use. So I want to say, I wouldn't want them to get access to my FaceTime, for example, maybe for, uh, for privacy or security reason. In that case, so now the to lend is really, really the reference that you're going to pass to somebody else maybe some other external clients. In that case, if they can get hold of this particular uh, reference over here, so now when they say to land, they wouldn't be able to say, uh, for example, uh, to say to land, if they try to say dot FaceTime. In that case, they wouldn't be able to do it. So I would say that could be one uh, conceptual reason you can think of 
why you want to do upward casting. But I would say, apparently, that's not a very robust access control because wherever we actually got this reference over here, they can downcast again into iOS right? again, right? So they can use the FaceTime. Well, I'm just trying to give you some conceptual idea. I would say typically you wouldn't really do upper casting because it's going to reduce uh, the number of expectation. However, synthetically you can do it. You just have to know what the consequence is. So Mohammed, does it make sense to you about upper casting? Okay, very good, okay. Yeah, but I think uh, this, uh, this concept about access control, you can think about conceptually, that could be one loose way of doing it, but that's not very robust, as I explained. But uh, I would say real, uh, usually for your application, I cannot think of it within your own application, you wouldn't really want, uh, you wouldn't need to do upper casting, but it's available to you in case you find a need. Right. Okay, very good. Guys, any more questions? Uh, you're more than welcome to ask me uh, lectures from the previous week. That's no problem. Okay, I know maybe some of you are still trying to catch up. That's no problem. Okay. All right. So I don't think uh, the lecture contents uh, for the following two weeks will be too difficult uh, because we're still talking about design patterns. I think as long as you're uh, you have a solid uh, understanding about inheritance, uh, typecasting, polymorphism, that I'm binding. I don't think the design patterns will be too difficult for you, except the, uh, the most exciting pattern that we're gonna talk about called Visitor, but it will come uh, maybe in about two weeks time. And then after we talk about all the design patterns, there will be two more lectures about program verification. So that one there will be uh, a little bit more formal stuff, but which uh, will be quite important for you to learn about design. But we'll get there, right? We got uh, three, or more, uh, three or four more uh, lectures to come. Are we going to have a uh, project start a Q and A? Yes, uh, I'm thinking about it. Uh, I'm thinking about whether it would be better. Uh, uh, okay, again for the projects, the most important part would be for you to read through the documents, uh, the PDF, the messages.txt, and etc. I'm thinking about maybe I will hold a Q and A uh, early next week, uh, so so that I can uh, just go over with you some uh, some acceptance test. Uh, on the on the uh, starter and just to show you how things work. But before that, I think I want to give you more time just about how to uh, uh, read the instructions. And then apparently you can see on the forum, uh, both me and Kevin, especially Kevin, we are trying to help you clarify any confusion from the instructions. You can see many of your fellow students have posted questions related to the projects. But I think for the Q&A, I may want to do it maybe early next week. And then I'll just try to go over some acceptance tests together with you, just in case you have doubts. So Robbie, you're still a little confused. Let's see. Say we statically declare some variable of uh, as iOS, and could you call a quick? Uh, okay, let's see. Let's do exactly what Robbie is suggesting over here. Let's try. So Noah, I would say before early early next week, I'll try to find a time before early next week. You may actually want to just make sure you go over all the instructions and also uh, the messages.txt and possibly some. Uh, acceptance test as well. And definitely want to start your developments. And then when I go through the uh, acceptance test together with you early next week, I'll try to see if there's any tip about development I can give you. Maybe some hints, I'll see, okay? Early next week, okay, very good. Yeah, but guys, don't wait for the Q&A helped by me, right? You definitely want to get started, right? All right, so now here's Robbie's question. Let me put it there. So what Robbie is saying, let me uh, be very precise. Uh, let's say we declare some variable, let's say uh, mine. Statically is iOS. And then dynamically, dynamically it's uh, iPhone 11 Pro, okay, sure. Apparently this as dynamic uh, assignment is okay, right? That's uh, something we discussed already. So now, uh, basically, Robbie, you were asking, let's say given the iOS static type and also iPhone 11 Pro dynamic type. Okay. So now you're still a little bit wondering about, can we say, uh, can we actually call 
my dot quick take. The answer is you cannot, even though the dynamic type supports quick take. However, the static type determines about the expectation on mine. So the mine is iOS. iOS does not declare quick take, so this cannot work. This will only work if you have a typecast. So Robbie, makes sense to you? Good. So Robbie, let me just uh, do a follow up uh, with you. This wouldn't compile. However, if you try the following, if you say do a cast, you can say check attached. Because I'm so sure the dynamic type is actually iPhone 11 Pro. I can say iPhone 11 Pro. And then my S, let's say IP for iPhone, okay? Then, so now you can see the IP over here statically will now be iPhone 11 Pro. So what's happening over here, let's be more uh, diagrammatically speaking. You can think about mine initially uh, declared to be iOS. It's pointing to some objects over here of iPhone 11 Pro. Okay, again, so this is a static type and this is the dynamic type. That's, that is why when you only use mine, whatever usage you want to go on the mine, it has to be restricted by the static type. Okay, that's why you cannot call quick take. Okay, so this would not be okay. And now what we're doing for the cast is like this, as we said in the lecture. So IP over here is going to be an alias that is pointing to the same object over here. But now since it's a downward casting over here, so what's happening here is the, uh, the static type for IP would be uh, simply iPhone 11 Pro. So now when you say IP dot quick take. So now because IP has a static type iPhone 11 Pro, so it's guaranteed to be available. So now that will be okay. Okay, Robbie, makes sense to you? No, we are not changing the dynamic type in a cast. No, you don't change anything. So whatever you do a casting over here, like in Java, like in any OOP, whenever you're doing a cast, you're, base, you're not changing anything about the dynamic type. The object remains the same, okay? Also, you're, mod, you're not modifying the uh, original static type. Also, you're not. All you're doing is you're creating a new pointer, like an alias. You can think about you're copying the address of this particular object here into IP. The only thing you're doing different, uh, the only thing the compiler will do is for this particular new alias variable is going to uh, declare its static type to whatever the cast type you have, assuming that the cast is actually successful. So you don't modify the dynamic type. You don't modify the static type. All you do is you're creating an alias with a different static type, depending on what kind of cast you're doing. Robbie, is it okay? Good, very good. Okay, any more questions? Any more? Everybody is okay? Do you have TA this week? For sure you have TA, yes, for sure. Yes, you do. You have TA every week. Yeah, we have TA uh, lab hours will be Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Yes, you do. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if you wish to dis uh, discuss about your design, uh, either for the lab three or the projects, uh, feel free to visit my office hour. Yeah, if uh, I don't have many people waiting there, I can spend more time with you. But even if I have many people there, I'll try to speak to you maybe at least for maybe five or 10 minutes. So at least I can give you some quick feedback, uh, which might be beneficial for you, yeah? Whichever way you like, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to provide as many means of help in this course as possible, so you can try different ones, whichever that suits for you, okay. Okay, I'll wait for maybe uh, 
a few more moments to see if uh, you guys have uh, any more questions before I call it a day. Eric, are you okay? Okay, very good. Very good, very good. Okay, so uh, let's see. Do I see any new name over here? So Emro, you okay for the uh, contents? Very good. All right. Okay, guys, it seems like uh, we don't have any more, any new we do. Okay. Okay, Nora was asking about the quizzes. Okay. So are all the quizzes counted in the final grade uh, or you're counting 11 out of 12? Actually, we're actually going to count everything. I tell you why. I didn't make, uh, well, I didn't change anything. So let me tell you why. So if you go to uh, the syllabus, okay, and if I go to grading scheme, if I can find it, oh, here, yes. Yeah, so you can see we got 12 study quizzes, right? So each one of them should count 2%. Yeah. Very good, okay. And then we also got the exam. Uh, but I think for the exam, don't worry, because our exam, uh, excuse me, our scheduled exam uh, is on uh, December 20th. So I think after the last day of your, our class, which will be December 8th, we got about almost two weeks uh, for you to study for the exam. Of course, I know you got other things to study as well, but at least we can schedule maybe uh, between two to three review sessions for you. So you can ask me any questions related to uh, the study materials. I think uh, that's something I can do. Right. Yeah, so Paris was asking, will the exam be multiple choice question as well? I haven't really finalized my mind, but I think uh, for your exam, you will definitely get multiple choices. So how many percentages will, uh, will the multiple, multiple choice questions be? I'm not too sure yet, but I'm hoping to give you more, more confirmed ideas, maybe after the last day of the class. I'm still thinking about it. It also, depend, uh, also depends on how many TA, TA hours I got to graduate exam, okay? But I would say when you actually prepare for your exam, uh, if you wish to start earlier, you may not want to assume that there's, there, uh, there's really going to be just multiple choice. There might be some short question answer for your uh, exam, okay? So for the exam, uh, we'll be more focused on our lecture materials. Yeah, for sure. You know, you can think about, uh, well, may not be a very good analogy, but you can think about an exam is like a combination of all the quiz coverage, right? You know, put, to put everything together. I think uh, for, the, uh, for the, you can think about each quiz question is really asking a very specific detail about your lecture. But I think for the exam, it's gonna be putting many things together. Maybe uh, one question there, is going to involve the uh, understanding from several lectures, right? So that's why it's called comprehensive exam. Yeah, but I'll give you more ideas. You know, once we get to the review uh, stage for the exam, you don't have to worry too much. But for those of you who actually want to uh, start preparing your exam earlier, I would suggest you may want to start reviewing the slides. Uh, maybe review. You don't really have to rewatch all the videos. You don't have that much spare time, I don't think. So I would say just go over uh, the slides and maybe go over the uh, examples I did on my iPad. If, you, if there's any part that you think uh, you, want me, uh, you want to review for more explanation, either drop by my office hour, I can explain to you, or you can uh, simply just, um, uh, just, uh, just rewatch that part of the, uh, of the video, right? Can we have a practice test, please? Yeah, I can get, definitely give you some practice questions. Yes, that's possible, yeah. I'll try to make this available maybe, uh, by, uh, by your last class. Yeah, no problem. That's fair. Okay, guys, any more questions? Any more concern? Yeah, so uh, a friendly reminder to you. So the project has been released since uh, last Monday. So I hope at least you start, you start to read through the uh, PDF and also the messages are TXT and etc. 
and it'll be even nicer if you already started coding. I think it'll be very important. Don't expect your design uh, to be very perfect in the first instance. Don't expect that. So it will be some, uh, some refactoring you may have to do, uh, maybe in the phase two. But in phase one, we do not check the structure of your code. So as long as you can make the basic features to work, that's covered by 80, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 15 uh, started tests given to you, you'll be fine for phase one. Okay, I think uh, everybody seems to be all right. All right, so I'm going to end the session now. And then uh, for those of you who want to join tomorrow again, uh, prepare some questions and then I will see you tomorrow. All right, have a good night. I'll see you later.